Hello and welcome. I'm Tom Ackerman from KMOX and the Cardinals Radio Network, and welcome to Ball Talk, put on by the St. Louis chapter of the Baseball Writers Association of America. There is no podcast like this, not anywhere, not in any sport that I'm aware of. This is a group of competitive writers. They all compete with each other here in this market, but we also bring in a guest from other markets in a roundtable setting. We debate, we have spirited conversation, we talk about the sport, the game of baseball, the business, and the respect that we all have for journalism and the hope that the excellence of it continues. That's what this is all about. The Baseball Writers Association of America puts on an excellent dinner at the end of the season and leading into the next season. And we are gonna have a lot of fun with this all season long. This is a podcast called Ball Talk, and let's get right to it. Well, in our first episode of Ball Talk, if you recall, we talked about the game and the wave of the amazing young talent coming in, Fernando Tatis Jr., Dylan Carlson in the Cardinals outfield, Ronald Acuna Jr. in Atlanta. The players are playing baseball with a flair really not seen since the Negro Leagues. And really in this conversation, front and center, we are talking about the rising stars in baseball journalism. Last week we had Katie Wu and Ben Fredrickson. They're terrific. This week, we bring in some more young rising stars in the business, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome from the Belleville News Democrat, Jeff Jones, the beat writer for the St. Louis Cardinals in that great newspaper. How are you doing, Jeff? Hello, sir. I'm doing fantastic. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great. It's good to see you again. Please welcome the newest on the scene. Well, I would say Katie and Zach tied for the newest at this point, covering the Cardinals from MLB.com. Zach Silver, great to have you along. Thanks for having me, guys. Good to get to kind of get together for one of the first times in a little bit. Zach, what's been your impression so far of St. Louis uh, making your way from the D.C. area? Yeah, it's uh, it's a different city. You know, I, when I was kind of thinking about getting out there, I was wondering if I need a car and uh, quickly learned that I will, in fact, need a car big time. Used to the East Coast hustle and bustle a little bit more. So it's going to take some getting used to, but I'm sure soon enough it'll get second nature. And Jeff, I know it's been a lot of fun for you on the beat. Once again, with the Belleville News Democrat, you do a terrific job. How's the season going so far for you? Thank you. Uh, it's been going pretty well so far. It's been, you know, moving back toward normal, right? Like every every day at the park feels a little more like a normal day than the one before it. So that's, that's a huge plus as we're going through this season. No doubt about it. Let me bring in another big star in the business. Uh, he has covered the NBA and MLB for Forbes, cut his teeth at Baseball Prospectus, worked for the Chicago Tribune, and now look at this. At the age of 25, he has made the move to become the beat writer of the Cubs for the Chicago Sun-Times. Welcome to Baseball Talk, Ball Talk, Russ Dorsey. How are you? Um, I'm doing very well. What a what a lovely intro by you, sir. Uh, I appreciate that. I will pay you off mic. Uh, <laughs> but no, I'm happy to be with you guys. What's going on? I'm doing well. Russell Dorsey, I mean, what is it what has it been like for you in Chicago, Russ, to to be covering this team? But you know, you've moved up pretty quickly. I I admire it. I appreciate it. No, it's uh it's been a fun year. Obviously, uh going into year two on the beat of going into your first year on the beat during the COVID year wouldn't be how I drew it up, but honestly, obviously we can't control that at all, but it's been a lot of fun and uh, getting some good work out there despite that. And, and like Jeff said, we're getting closer to getting back to doing things the way they should be done. So looking forward to the rest of this year. Uh, we really want to know your thoughts in Chicago about everything. And I want to get right to this. I know you cover the Cubs, but you know where mm -hmm. I'm going. I want to go with yeah. the White Sox. I mean, Tony La Russa is all over social media. He's not. Uh, people talking about him are, and, and it's everywhere. And, you know, it's about the unwritten rules of baseball. Uh, the Baseball is a game played with a bat and a ball governed by rules under the direction of the commissioner of baseball. Baseball is a game played by human beings and governed by unwritten rules of survival and self-preservation. That is a line from Joe Garagiola. And uh, Joe was uh, a legend here in St. Louis. And, you know, I, I want to ask you about uh, what Tony La Russa did. So let's, let's first talk about the situation. So the pitch came from a position player at about mm -hmm. 47 miles an hour on a 3-0 pitch. 
and Mercedes hit the ball a mile. First of all, that was super impressive on a right. pitch that wasn't yeah. coming very hard at him. Uh, and La Russa didn't like it at all. Uh, he actually came out onto the field to play and uh, shouted at his own player and later talked about the, the unwritten rules were broken and there will be consequences, et cetera. What's, first of all, been the reaction in Chicago, and how do you feel about it? Well, I, I think Tony La Russa is definitely a hot-button issue here in the city of Chicago for a lot of different reasons. Uh, but if we're going to focus in on this one, I, I think the big talk has been the fact that not not just the 3-0 homer like if if what la Russa said is true that mercedes missed the take sign that's a separate issue like yeah that's something that you your manager your coaching staff the player they deal with off the field but when it comes to this aspect of respecting the game i don't think in a blowout game where the twins conceded you concede when you put a position player on the mound that, that's what that is um it's in the ninth inning there's two outs Nobody wants to have walks with a position player on the mound. So why not put the ball in play? I don't have a problem with that. I don't think the baseball world at large had a problem with that. But for whatever reason, the Twins took exception to that, which is strange when the Twins also conceded that game. And two outs in the ninth inning, the game's over anyway. Um, The problem that I think the city of Chicago, not just White Sox fans, but people in baseball have had a problem with was the fact that Tony La Russa threw his guy under the bus publicly, uh, not only saying that he was wrong for swinging 3-0, uh, he has to learn to respect the game, uh, that he apologized to the Twins, and honestly gave the Twins license to throw at his guy the next night, which they did. Even after La Russa apologized to Rocco Baldelli, the Twins still took that opportunity to throw at Mercedes. And the fact that even after that, you said, listen, I don't have a problem with the way they handled that, um, and did ne- not once, even when given several opportunities to, didn't stand up for his guy. And so I think that's what people have an issue with. And it seems like every two weeks there's these issues with Tony La Russa. I know he's a this uh, legend in St. Louis, but since then, he's a shell of himself as a manager. And that's the bigger issue here. It seems like each week there's something with Tony La Russa in the dugout where it's like, all right, why is this person in this position? Well, I do feel that. I sense that there's this opportunity sometimes to pounce on the roost. And now in this case, I do not agree with him. I think that you need to let the young man play. This is not youth baseball. Uh, you know, we're talking about the big leagues here and people are putting in their dues and Mercedes has been putting in dues for a long time and is right. getting paid to do it. Uh, but at the same time, Russ and Zach and Jeff, you can all jump in here, but I kind of feel like can't there be a balance too? Like if we're going to move forward in this game, can't we also listen to what LaRusso is saying? Because he does represent the old school. We may not agree with it, but I'd like to hear him out. I've covered LaRusso. I, I covered him for a long time. I, there's a method to everything that he does. And I think what he's trying to do here is establish his power in that clubhouse and try to show everybody who's boss. I'm not sure it's going to work, Zach, but uh, that that's really how I feel about it. I, I think maybe there's a little too much piling on going. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see that. I mean, I think Tony's kind of operating at a position of a disadvantage where he's just been away from the game for so long. He's entering a clubhouse that is known around the league as one of the youngest, one of the most fun, one of the most, uh, you know, one of the, one of the most exciting fit clubhouses in the league. And he's coming in almost pushing 80 and been out of the game for so long. I think there's just a big natural disconnect that's going to be there. And I know some people are making the argument, maybe he was trying to jump in front of it. Maybe he was trying to save your mean. Maybe he was trying to to not put so much pressure on the rookie. And then that kind of all goes out the window when after that, he says, I think it was okay. I think what the twins did was appropriate. I had no issue with it. Um, I think, you know, it, it comes to also be a larger issue at whole where, you know, Tony LaRusso cared more about the unwritten rule in this situation when he forgot about the written rule where he didn't know a couple of weeks ago that a pitcher didn't have to run in the extra innings. Um, I think it's just kind of a, a bigger issue at large about kind of where baseball is right now about the young, gu- the old guard trying to keep their rules in place and trying to keep what they want to be, um, you know, keep, keep that instilled in baseball and this, this new wave of young players who want to make, want to be themselves, want to be the, the big home run hitters, which is, which is totally respectful and totally great. Um, and you see major league baseball is pushing that when they have the, the, their make it grand, Oslo grande, these, these different initiatives that they're trying to push, but you still have some of these, some of these kind of gatekeepers in the league that are still in these positions of power that are keeping the league kind of from hitting that full stride and where it, where it can be. And, 
it's just such an interesting dichotomy in, in Chicago. Where you have the most fun, young, exciting clubhouse in the league, and then the manager who's kind of trying to keep that hushed up. Yeah, and I think, too, that one of the things about this which was so interesting to me was thinking about it in the context of the Cardinals, because a couple of weeks ago we saw the Phillies and, and Hector Neris pretty clearly retributively hit Nolan Arenado after Genesis Cabrera hit Bryce Harper in the face with a fastball. And that night after Harper was hit, when we talked to Schultz after the game, there was a lot of discussion about what is this going to look like? You know, what, what, what's the kind of code here? And, and Mike Schilt was pretty open about it. You know, look, they'll handle their business. We'll do what we have to do, et cetera, and so on. No one gets hit the next night and, and Schilt in the post game said some of the similar things. And that's not surprising because I know that Schilt and Tony are very close. Some of the similar things you heard from Tony where he said, look, they handled their business the right way. We know this is how it works. It's fine. The difference though, is that in this case, you're talking about a star player with the Phillies who got hit in the face with a fastball versus having a position player on the mound in a blowout uh, and a guy swinging 3-0. I think in, you know, in, in the former case, in the case with the Phillies and the Cardinals, Maybe in that that unwritten rule context, it's not totally outside. You know, look, you don't want baseballs thrown at star players. That's bad for the game. Is it totally outside the lines for Nolan Arenado to have to wear one in the back after Bryce Harper wears one in the jaw? That's, maybe you can defend that. I don't think in this situation you can defend it, especially because like, like Zach, like you mentioned, and Russ as well, that – the conversation on Tuesday when Tony is talking to the Chicago media and says, you know, your means going to have to learn about this. There are, there's going to be consequences within our family, but he's not going to be benched. But then after that game, after he's thrown behind to basically run interference for Tyler Duffy and the twins, that to me is where Tony crosses the line across the unwritten rules into not defending his player the way a manager needs to. You lose yeah. your clubhouse, you know, yeah. you lose the trust of the 26 guys that, Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams have put together, um, that trust is gone, right? Because how can I look at you as my manager and say, that guy has my back when you let uh, my brother, my teammate get thrown at and you didn't take a side and you didn't defend him and you didn't come to his defense. You took the side of the team that threw at him. And, and Tony already, right. And, and Tony already is operating from a trust deficit, right? Because yes, the process absolutely. made him the manager did not involve the way that these processes usually work, right? It involved Jerry Reinsdorf let Hawk Harrelson fire Tony 40 years ago, and he's been mad about it for 40 years, and this was his chance. He was going to get Tony back. And so rather than going through whatever process you would go through to consider, or, or maybe even not replacing Rick Renteria, but, but rather than going through that process, it's just it was just going to be Tony no matter what. And that's the thing that's interesting about this is, you know, you read conversation and you hear, well, you know, can Tony hang on to this job if he's lost the clubhouse? Of course he can't because until he's lost Jerry Reinsdorf, it doesn't matter what he lost. He's going to have that job until he doesn't anymore. And that's a hard way to operate as a manager. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's, that's totally true. It's just, it's just crazy. I mean, you saw Lance Lynn came out and said, you know, another Cardinals connection, Lance Lynn comes out and says, this is just the way the game's played. It's not a problem. If you're going to put a position player on the mound, it means you obviously aren't really caring about this game anymore. So, you know, that's just going to happen. And then you see Tony La Russa come out and say, well, that's why he's in a locker and I'm in a, I'm in an office. And which is, I mean, I just don't know how, you know, like you said, like this is Jerry Reinsdorf's decision. This is going to be his job until Jerry Reinsdorf decides it's not. I just don't know how you're someone on that club and is excited going out to play for Tony tomorrow. And if we're talking about Lance Lynn, a guy who pitched an entire year, with a torn UCL, needed Tommy John and pitched an entire season as a starter and only threw fastballs because he couldn't throw breaking balls because his elbow was shredded, but his team needed. Like, you don't get more old school and hardcore than Lance Lynn, who stood out there and threw literally 100% fastballs and was an above average starter when he did it. And if that guy thinks you're over the line, then Tony needs to reexamine where he's at. Yeah, I will say this, that Tony, uh, you know, that stuff isn't going to work anymore now. When I covered him, I mean, he sparred with us. He, he sparred with – uh, players that he didn't always have that clubhouse. I mean, he made guys upset. Uh, he benched guys, he, but ultimately he had them spraying champagne twice and everybody feels pretty good when that's happening. And I think there's a chance he could take this White Sox team all the way. But ultimately what I'd like to see is that everybody learns from this, that Tony learns where the game is going, but also that it sparked a conversation that this game is advancing and maybe some, something good can come out of this for baseball moving forward. That's my hope anyway, uh, for not only the White Sox, but for Major League Baseball in this situation, because I think the game has a great future ahead of it, no doubt about it. Uh, what about, uh, Russ, you mentioned this earlier, and I want to move on to another topic, and that is uh, 
COVID. I mean, we're now coming out of it. We're going to have a full capacity stadium on June 14th here in St. Louis. People are excited about that. What is that? You mentioned it earlier. What has it been like for you covering the sport in a pandemic era? Uh, something that we've never experienced before. Odd, man. It's odd. It's strange. It's not how the job is supposed to be done on like we're having this con great conversation on Zoom. And it's awesome. And you can't tell that, you know, we're not in the same room, but, you know, it'd be great to do this in person. Like it, it's great to be able to have that those conversations with a manager or a player in person. Um, and we haven't been able to do that over the last 15 months. Now, I think what's been cool for me personally, um, we've been getting in-person interviews and access since about, um, you know, that third week of spring training, uh, just being able to work with uh, the Cubs PR staff and, and be able to do it safely and, it's been great. It's worked. And, you know, we've kind of helped lead the charge with the rest of the beats in baseball uh, when it comes to, you know, how to do this and, and, and making sure that we can slowly get back to the way, you know, we do things. And I think that's, that's great because, you know, you talk to players, they want it back to the way it was. They want to be able to talk to us in person. They want to be able to have that discussion on nuanced things that you can't always get uh, on in a zoom press conference. You know, there are things that we can disseminate, that can't be shared in this platform, you know? Uh, so I, I think it's been, it's been weird. Um, and I think if you ask any beat writer across the country, it, what they prefer, you're, you're going to get one answer. And so it, it's, it's nice that we're getting back and we're starting to get some of that access back, but I am, uh, will be, I will never <laughs> be upset when I have to go into a, a clubhouse and can't find anybody anymore because it'll just be nice to be in there again. Yeah. I will say I, you know, I'm really relieved to hear Russ say that it's getting back to normal at Wrigley uh, because last summer, Derek Gould and I spent a couple of weeks at Wrigley sitting on a folding table on the concourse because we weren't allowed for health and safety reasons to be in the press box getting rained on by spiders. Uh, it turns out when there are no people in a baseball stadium for a couple of months, it gets a little buggy. Uh, I think Derek has a little spider bite scar to, 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 to back that up. But no, it, it's, it is, you know, and, and to Russ's point, as we're recording this on a Thursday, on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday evening was the second of a, of a Cardinals two game set with the Pirates, and there were a few of us that were down, you know, just around the Cardinals dugout and and, and, and near the uh, near the screen during batting practice and, and having conversations with guys and being able to get work done. And at one point, you know, Mike Schill pops up from the dugout and takes a look and looked around and he saw us and he goes, "How's it going? This is great." And the first thing he wanted to know is, "When are you guys getting back in the clubhouse?" And it's like. Mike, believe me, if I knew I would, we'd be in there today. I'd be hopping over this rail, you know? Yeah. And, and I think that that to me was really reassuring because it does back up what Russ was talking about, which is that the players also wanted to get back mm -hmm. to normal because nobody likes the zoom room. It's nobody likes it. it. Just not even in terms of, of the difficulty of communicating, but the, the politics of a clubhouse are such that sometimes when you think you want to talk to a guy, you walk in there for pregame or postgame and you just get a vibe that maybe today's not the day. Yeah. And that helps build those relationships, right? And you can't do that in a Zoom world. It's okay, I need to get this written. I need this guy sometime in the next four or five days. And if it's not, if it's not working that day, and and thankfully they've been good about it. The Cardinals have about sucking it up and you know, we'll we'll get it done. But that doesn't it's not great for the players and it's not great for us either. Right. Yeah. I mean, even, you know, just going to a Zoom room and having some post game glitches, you know, just talking to Nolan Arenado and having it cut in and out just is the most inopportune and unideal circumstance you could possibly have. And, you know, especially for someone as a first year on their beat, not having the ability to go up to a guy, shake his hand and say, Hey, my name is Zach. I'm covering the Cardinals this season. It's just such a disadvantage to, to not be able to, to put a face or, you know, a handshake to the name. Um, you know, Zoom only allows you to do so much in a, in a little box and a window on the TV screen or whatever setup they have. Um, so it's just such a such a disadvantage. You can't really go up to a guy and say, hey, I'd love to talk to you about this for, for 20 minutes. It's, it's really if we got you on Zoom today, we can talk about it in a group setting. But for someone trying to just really, I don't want to say establish myself in the, in the clubhouse, but just try to be a presence. It's impossible to do that when, when all you're doing is being able to talk to a guy through a video camera right now. And I'll say this, like to Zach's point, we were in similar situations, uh, him this year, me last year. I've been I've been one of the only people uh, in the country to, to travel. And I've been traveling for each road trip. And, you know, I've been using that time, that access that I have on the road because it's easier to do it on the road than 
back in Chicago with all the, the news outlets that we have. But to be able to talk to Chris Bryant one on one, to be able to talk to Anthony Rizzo and be able to talk to David Ross and be able to, to build these relationships uh, that you can't like Zach was talking about, you know, in that a lot of time, the shared space that everybody has when there's, you know, in, in our market, you have 40, 50 people on a Zoom call sometimes. So it's nice to be able to, you know, get back on the road and start to like really dig in on, on how this job is done. And like I'm. You know, when we're recording this, it's right before this Cubs Cardinal series. Like, I'm going to get to see you guys in person. Like, and that's awesome. And I think that's another part of this last year that you miss is like a lot of us have known each other and see each other, but not being able to see your friends around the game. Like, that sucks. So, yeah, it's nice to be able to, to see you guys in person, actually. Well, and that's, yeah. and that's and it's real, real quick. I wanted to point out something that, that Russ has mentioned there, which is a really important part of the job that I think is maybe not as well understood. It's, it is a little bit inside baseball, but the road trip is where the good work gets done because yeah. it's not that, you know, uh, you know, again, they, they're, they're TV stations at home, they're radio stations. People have, people have their jobs to do. And that's totally, obviously totally fine. But when you get on the road and there's three people in the clubhouse instead of 33, it makes a big difference in the depths of the conversations you have. And that makes the coverage better because like Zach was talking about, it does matter for a writer or, or any media person. Tom knows this to, to, to be able to establish themselves, to build trust and to build these relationships that allow real conversations to happen. And that's when real stories get told. I'll tell you from just using La Russa as an example, a thousand times better in a smaller setting or uh, just off to the side or in his office than a press conference like the zoom does him no favors he's going to be guarded he's going to be combative if you get him behind the scenes he'd take off his hat and sit back in his chair and say all right so here's what's going on and he and he would you would establish a relationship and trust i think it might have served him a little bit better maybe to explain that in that kind of a setting but we'll see i don't know um let, let's talk cards cubs you know so how far apart are these organizations do you think jeff i'm going to circle to you because you're in Belleville now. It's Cardinals country for sure, but yeah, you got some Cubs fans running around the state of Illinois. I mean, what's the chatter around there? Have the Cardinals uh, leaped them by a considerable amount, or uh, do the Cubs have a good future ahead? Yeah, I was excited to see Russ. I, I plugged my Chicago flag up in the background behind. Yes, me. absolutely. Let's go. Yeah. Right, look, look, look. What are you doing here, Jeff? Who's that? <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing this week? It's important to know that any any dude who lived in Chicago in his twenties just owns a Chicago flag. Like it comes with the welcome kit, right? So I had one banging around yeah. the house, so it goes up there. Um, no, so I think it's interesting because today, May twentieth. I don't know that these organizations are particularly that far apart right now today. Ask me on July 20th, because, or rather August 20th, I guess, because by that point, the divergence, I think, is going to be pretty wide, uh, because it, it does seem like this is a Cardinals team that is ascending and a Cubs team that that seems to be descending in part by age, but in part by design. I don't, you know, I don't think it's unreasonable. You know, you look at sort of the nucleus of that 2016 championship team, and they just had a big week of celebration in Chicago of John Lester and Kyle Schwarber being back, but they're back because they're gone. Right, that's what it means to be back. Uh, and you look at what this team for the you know, what the Cubs might look like with Rizzo and Baez, especially coming down to you know coming down to and, and Bryant, right for sure, Bryant coming down to the trade deadline this summer. It's really hard for me to imagine those three guys being Cubs next summer. It's sort of hard for me to imagine all three of those guys being Cubs in August, especially when you talk about Chris Bryant. So. And I don't know, to me, at least those three guys plus Contreras are the guys who make up the identity of this Cubs team. And it's not unreasonable to think that all three of them, or at least two of them will not be Cubs next summer. Uh, and that seems to point the Cubs in a downward direction. What do you think, Russ? You're with them all the time. No, I'm, I'm, I, I'm picking up what Jeff is putting down. And I think there's a lot of truth to what he's saying. I think it was always people, you know, had this conception of the Cubs coming in that, oh, it's a wrap. It's done. People have had Chris Bryant traded for the last three seasons. And, and after the the injuries that he's had, I think fans were at a point where they, they were just like, all right, well, if we're going to do it, just get it over with. Uh, when the, the fact remained that this was a, still a really talented group. You know, I don't think if you ask any of the 30 teams that they said 60 games was, you know, the, the real scope of who they were as a team. So getting back to an, into 162 where you can – let a season actually play out and you can go to, through the ebbs and flows 
uh, of a normal season, I think you would start to see who these guys really were. And with a healthy Chris Bryant, you're seeing the MVP that we saw back in 2016 when the one of the top five war players in 2017 and, and a guy who has never uh, had failure at the big league level until the last one or two seasons. So it's it was always going to be based on performance. And the way they're performing right now in May, they look like one of the better teams in the National League. If that's the case, then maybe those guys are still here at the trade deadline and after that. And maybe you do extend one, two, or maybe even all three of those guys. So I think the performance aspect of it is a a lot uh, more important than the fact that, oh, these guys might be getting a little older. Like, look at when they had their success. They were in their early 20s. Chris Bryant just turned 30. Javi Baez is just going to turn 30 this year. You know, Anthony Rizzo is the oldest person in that group. And and Wilson Contreras is, is 27, 28 years old. So, These guys aren't, you know, Albert Pujols going to the Dodgers, you know, at 40 years old. Like these guys aren't long in two. They still have a lot of good baseball in them left. Will that last? Will that be here in Chicago? Who knows? But I think they're they're the way they're playing. I think they're starting to realize that, hey, we're still good at baseball. We still have something left. Even if this is the last year of us, you know, as a collective together, you know, who's to say that we can't perform two or three of us and be the, the, the core of this group? of the next wave of that great Cubs team going forward. Well, I real quick, I wanted to ask Russ this because I'm as a person who is not around the Cubs, obviously nearly as much. Does Chris Bryant, do you think the baseline of the way he got to the big leagues and everything that came around his service time stuff and, 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 and everything that, that happened as a result of that, has there been enough, can there ever be enough repair of that relationship to keep Chris Bryant off the market? Because it seems to me like as a person just from outside that when the Cubs made that decision and when a grievance got filed, it was just sort of fait accompli that, okay, Bryant's going to free agency. And then that's just how it's going to be. I think a lot of that has to do with who his agent is. Yeah. And there's always been this perception of Chris Bryant because his agent is Scott Boris. But one of the things that shocks people when I talk about Chris Bryant is that He's one of the most down to earth superstars you will ever meet across any sport. And people are shocked by that because he has this mega agent that represents them. Yes. I think he was bothered by the way that situation was handled in 2015, where they said, Hey, if you go out and you perform, you can make the big league roster. He had one of the best springs we've ever seen and did not make the team. I think that really bothered not only him, but also Scott. Well, look, Michael was really good that spring. You know, then <laughs> KB had to work on his defense, even right, right. play all nine positions on the field. Um, but yeah, I, I think he just after that just went about his business. And I he's loved Chicago. He's never said he didn't want to be in Chicago. And I think the relationship that he and Jed Hoyer have, who's the president of baseball operations now, is a really big part of this dynamic. And who's to say that, you know, maybe with Theo for as much winning as he did. Maybe having that different voice now in a role of of being the president of baseball ops with Jed, I think that might be enough to say, all right, let's come back to the table. Let's if if you're going to be this MVP that we've always believed you were and going to be healthy, let's make you the the, the Chris Bryant of the next 10 years where you're going to be the guy, the face of the franchise after Riz retires and be in that role. Because, you know, from from a player perspective, he's everything you want. He's great with the media. He's great with the public. You know, he's a, a, a fantastic player. He's versatile, plays every position you need him to, has 10 gloves in his bag and, and just goes out there and does his job. So you want guys like Chris Bryant on your team. So it, it was, I guess over the next couple of months, we'll find out if that's going to be with the Cubs or with somebody else. Yeah, I think that's kind of been maybe the rub in all of this is that even though the Cubs kind of have been counted out, at least at the start of the season, you know, you go on a lot of podcasts, you go on a lot of, uh, you know, preview shows and it's who's going to win the central and everyone talks about the Brewers and the Cardinals, but the Cubs still have the pieces in place that if they're clicking on all cylinders and if they're playing to the level that their pedigree has kind of shown that they could still be a competitive team in the central. I mean, obviously, you know, the pitching maybe could use, use a little bit of a facelift, but that's kind of been what's been so fascinating about everyone talking about a Cubs decline and obviously kind of all these little, little nicks and crannies hitting a, and hitting ahead this off season this coming off season is going to be very telling, but it's, it's just so fascinating to talk about how the Cubs are kind of done when I feel like if you just count on your fingers, the amount of superstars they have, it's still pretty high compared to every other team. I mean, obviously the Cardinals, you have Nolan and, and Paul and Goldschmidt and, and Jack Flaherty, but you know, that's Rizzo who's, you know, maybe not borderline superstar, but still, you know, a, a very high caliber name and Chris Bryant, who's playing like one and 
Javier Baez, when he's playing at his best, can be one. So it's just it's interesting to talk about a decline when, for now, I guess, all these guys are still on the roster. They're not playing maybe like they used to in every aspect, but they're still there. And you just wonder if that's going to be something that can keep this team afloat for this season and how much, if they continue winning, it's going to just be tough to kind of sell these guys off. Anthony Rizzo. Yeah, that's interesting. Anthony Rizzo stays a Cub, right? Like, there's no, like, he can't be, like, Anthony Rizzo is Ryan Sandberg, right? Like, I, how, how does Rizzo go somewhere else? <laughs> I agree with you. I think that's the question that especially fans want to know. But at this point, it's a businessman, and I don't begrudge anybody for going and getting there. So right. we'll see what happens. Um, you know, he's he's gotten banged up. He's had back issues each of the last, I think, five seasons. So it's not going to be the easiest negotiation. But something I told people in the, in spring training when they didn't come to a contract extension, listen, it's a negotiation for a reason. Like, there's back and forth. You're not always going to be happy with the number that's thrown out there. So I, I think, yes, it'll go down to the wire even into this offseason. But I, I would be shocked if they didn't figure something out. Yes. I will say this. The Cardinals uh, watched the Cubs be successful in 2015, knock them out, win the World Series in 16. And I believe that the, the organizations are connected in that it sparked the Cardinals to be where they are now because it really agitated the fan base that the Cubs were good and you had to satisfy the customer. And I think that part of the reason the Cardinals have Arenado, Goldschmidt, Mike Schilt uh, managing the team is directly related to the Cubs success. So these two are kind of tied together in that way. And, and, you know, we have some questions coming in from fans. Uh, John and Wildwood submitted one. You can do the same uh, by just going to the Twitter page, St. Louis BBWAA and hashtag it STL ball talk. But John and Wildwood, Zach, uh, asked about all stars on both teams. And, and to your point, I mean, there are some big names on both of these teams just running through my head right now. I mean, Arenado is absolutely an all star, but there are some that are emerging, too. Alex Reyes is one who's notched uh, 13 saves. And, of course, Jack Flaherty's 8-0. Any others that that uh, you would put in there right away? Tommy Edmonds had a great year. Yeah, it's it's uh, those are definitely the, the three locks I would have if you were to ask me right now, which you are. Um, but uh, uh, I, would, I would maybe pay – you know, we'll see how, how Paul Goldschmidt can kind of keep his May going. He's had it in a great month, hitting over 300. And he was kind of lagging a little bit in April, but he's starting to turn it on a little bit. Um, and yeah, I mean, as far as true bona fide all stars, I'd say Tommy Edmond is maybe a borderline candidate. I think he does a lot of things well, but kind of as we've learned with Tommy Edmond, a lot of that is more valued within the team clubhouse than it is maybe on a, a grander scale. I mean, I've talked with a lot of friends who are and are not Cardinals fans. And I mean, Tommy Edmond just has the makeup of a guy where he gets a big hit in October. It's like Tommy Edmond, like <laughs> Tommy Edmond. Um, and I, I'm not sure if that, how much that plays in an all star setting. Um, but you know, it, it, that's kind of the rub with him is that he's going to do all the things that the team asks him to do. It's just not going to be exactly sexy in the box score and sexy in, in, in the, in the grand conversation of baseball at large. So, um, th- but those three, you mentioned are definitely the three locks I would have, which would bring Nolan back to Colorado for the second time in a few weeks, which would be certainly an entertaining storyline. Anybody else have a shot, Jeff? I got, I have one. I'm going to go a little bit of a dark horse here, but Harrison Bader, this is the version of Harrison Bader that is that is the ideal version of Harrison Bader, right? The guy who can put up an 800 OPS and, and play almost platinum glove level defense in center field. I, you know, look, it's, it's, it's hard to win a fan vote at, at three positions, plus have Jack Flaherty get named to the game as a pitcher. And it's really hard to fit four players from one team onto an all-star team, just given the way that those things are structured. But I don't know, man, Harrison Bader to me, it, it increasingly now that he's been healthy and now that he is replicating this over you know, close to a month now of playing time looks to me like the best possible version of that player. Uh, and if he can keep that up through this month and, and through June, that, that's a guy who to me looks like one of the best outfielders in the NL, which is not a thing I expected to be saying about Harrison Bader at this point in the season. Russ, what do you think on the Cubs side? There are two locks and there's a, a guy who has an outside shot. So the locks, Chris Bryant, obviously playing like not only an all-star, but an MVP. I think if the season is today, he would be, maybe in that top three of MVP candidates with uh, Ronald Acuna Jr. being one of the others. Uh, Chris Bryant, Craig Kimbrell has had a resurgence this year. And honestly, since September of last year has looked like the Craig Kimbrell of old, curveball for strikes, fastballs back to being electric, and he's really come through in a big way for that bullpen. Uh, that's another guy who, if, if things turn on the Cubs, 
here later in the season could be, you know, somewhere else at the trade deadline, but he's been a, a really great for, for the back end of that bullpen. So Craig Kimbrell, definitely uh, a lock as of right now. And then Nico Horner, this is a guy who didn't make the roster, you know, going out of coming out of, out of spring training uh, for a lot of different reasons. I think some of the reasons that people think weren't necessarily the case, but you know, those, that's one of those inside baseball types of things that, that you learn. Um, Nico Horner has, has been great for this club. He's playing a gold glove caliber second base. Really, every night you're seeing Nico throw himself around the field at second base. And you guys watching Colton Wong for a long time, you guys know what that's like. Uh, but Nico's, you know, swinging the bat really well and really establishing himself as, as one of the better young players uh, in, in the National League right now. So Nico, Craig Kimbrell, and Chris Bryant are the three guys that I think have a chance uh, for the Midsummer Classic. And Nico Horner. Tommy Edmonds double play combo partner at Stanford. Very good combo. That's a great, those guys defensively, like you're seeing what they're doing at the big league level and it's no surprise. That's a, that's a scrappy combination on second base. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we hope you're enjoying ball talk and thank you to all of you who have subscribed already. Now subscriptions are really great because all of the money goes to fund scholarships to take care of these young writers moving forward. And we thank you so much for them. The donation, $3 for a single episode. It's $12 for a half season and 20 bucks for the full subscription of 16 episodes of Ball Talk. In every episode of Ball Talk, we're going to look back at a moment from the archives. The Baseball Writers' Dinner is a St. Louis tradition, and you actually can go back. We have a YouTube channel now. A lot of people requested this. You can go back and see clips from the past eight years. They're available on the St. Louis BBWAA YouTube channel. You just go to search St. Louis Baseball Writers' Association, and it'll pop up for you. We're going to look back at the 2015 dinner. Bench coach Ali Marmol guided the state college spikes up in Pennsylvania to the league championship in 2014. The team had a great group, but they had a special influence in the clubhouse that helped Ollie draft the lineup every night. And I really hope that uh, you soak in this episode from the archives. This is one of the most memorable and emotional moments we ever had up on stage in the 62 year history of the baseball writers dinner here in St. Louis. This is Jen Langosh from MLB.com. There were championships won in this organization, and one of those was out in State College uh, with the Cardinals uh, short season team there, the Spikes. But the heart and soul of that team was probably not somebody you've read about. Um, he certainly was not somebody who showed up in the box score. He was a 10-year-old by the name of Josiah Vieira, who we're very honored and, and pleased to have here with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, the bench coach for the Spikes, number 10, Josiah Vieira. The strength of the State College Spikes this summer wasn't in their bats or their pitching. It was in the heart of Josiah Vieira. From the first time I saw him, he was just a, a wonderful kid, just full of energy, happy all the time. He brings a lot of life to the clubhouse. Um, he's probably one of my favorite parts of, of the day is having him in there in the clubhouse. He'll come up to you and say, hey, you guys got this today. And it's like he, almost he knows something that you don't. <laughs> Josiah met the Spikes at a Children's Miracle Network event in 2013. But this summer, he belonged to the Spikes team in a way he'd never imagined. They just kind of made a home here for him. He got a surprise. We got uniforms for him and has his name on the back. We came in one Saturday, I believe it was, and one of the pitchers came up to me. And he said, hey, did you were in the locker room? And I said, no, not yet. And he said, they got a locker for him in there. Oh, he's doing everything. He's hitting the cages with us. He's playing cars before the game. He'll take her around to BP with us. Oh! Uh, he just does it all. Sits in the dugout with us during the game. Um, gives us little pointers. You might think I'm joking, but he goes in there and he'll question my lineup at times and it'll make me think about it a little bit. But uh, sometimes he agrees with it, sometimes he doesn't. So when I get an approval, I feel pretty good about it. But more than his presence in the clubhouse or the dugout, right, let's get him. Let's go. It's his spirit that drives the spikes. A boy who has overcome life threatening infection and surgeries. A fighter who will live in the hearts of the spikes forever. It doesn't matter about winning or losing for him as much as it is just playing the game and being a part of it. You see the how blessed you are by looking at seeing what he's gone through and seeing his attitude. He has such a character about him. He's such a young guy. He's truly somebody to look up to. They all say he's his good luck charm, but uh, I kind of tell him, like, look, I know that, you know, you like good luck charm, but I hope he inspires you to play baseball. 
just to be the best you can be and look at the struggle that he went through and fought through because he's not supposed to be with us. God pulled him through it and I give him the credit for that and uh, he gave him back to us for a reason. And if it's just for this time here with these guys, that's what it's for because he just loves baseball. So a lot of people think we're doing something for him and they're absolutely wrong. Um, he's, he's done a lot for us and we've learned a lot from him um, and having him in that clubhouse is is very important to me. Josiah's just been a, a key part of what we've done this year and if, if we do anything this year, go ahead and, and make sure that he gets, a, he gets a championship. It's my honor to introduce to you Josiah Vieira. Uh, first of all, it's an absolute honor um, to be on stage with uh, the men behind me and the things that they've accomplished in their careers, as well as Josiah and what he's accomplished in his life. Um, to me, baseball grants you the opportunity uh, to experience some pretty neat things in life, um, and I was able to encounter one of those in 2014 with Josiah. If we back up a year to 2013, uh, I received an email regarding Josiah, uh, wanted to come to the stadium, meet the guys, hang out with us for a day. Um, so I remember looking up his E60 story that ESPN uh, did on him and uh, gained a little bit more background on his life and what he's been through and I showed it to the guys and we were determined um, to make this a memorable day for him, um, to make it one that he would remember, that he'd be excited about, um, but little did we know that he was going to impact our lives uh, far beyond what we can impact his. Um, so we invited him to BP, um, we spent some time with him, all the guys introduced themselves and after BP everybody gathered behind home plate and watched him hit BP and run the bases and he simulated hitting a walk-off home run and all the guys met him at home plate and kind of cheered him on and uh, later on that night um, we had a game and we ended up winning in that same fashion with the walk-off win and it was pretty exciting because two weeks after Josiah came in and visited us again and once again we had a walk-off win and a week after that he came to visit us and we walked off again so at this point I was trying to figure out how to get him a locker and a jersey and, and have him there full time. <laughs> But uh, that, that's exactly what happened. Um, in 2014, the guys cleared out a locker, they put his name on it, um, got him a jersey and his name on that as well, um, and he became part of the team. He was one of the guys. He'd show up early, he'd stretch with the team, uh, he'd hit BP, he'd run the bases, uh, catch and throw with them. He'd even play cards before the games. He was, he was one of them. Um, and every day at the same exact time, he'd come into my office and he'd uh, sit on my lap and he'd want to go through the lineup uh, every name and give me his approval on who was playing that day, um, which was great. And there were some days where he'd walk in and be a little disappointed at my lineup and he'd point his finger at the name and, and just kind of shake his head no. Um, and I'd have to explain to him that at that level, everybody kind of had an opportunity to play and he'd give me the same response every time. He'd say, well, we need a win tonight. Can he play tomorrow? Um, but, uh, I, I will admit to changing my lineup once uh, based on his suggestion. Um, halfway through the year, he walked into the office and he asked if we could win a championship for him, um, which is pretty neat. He wanted a ring. And the one time I changed my lineup was in uh, game three of this, uh, it was a decisive game three of the championship. And um, he came up to me in game two and he asked me to play one of the guys that never really played. Um, and I told him I didn't think it was a good idea, uh, being that it was an important game, and we ended up losing that game, so I went ahead and fired him in the third game, and that player ended up getting three RBIs and helped us win the championship that night, so it was uh, pretty exciting, but um, yeah. <laughs> But to be honest, this, uh, this has been more than just baseball. Um, those of us that had the pleasure of experiencing it, um, really, we, we gained a new perspective on life. It meant more to us than just baseball. And to be completely honest with you, Josiah has more fight and more courage in him than I could ever dream of having. So thank you for an unbelievable season. Thank you. And finally, and I want to direct this one to Zach, uh, who spent a lot of time in the D.C. area, and the legendary a writer from the Washington Post, Tom Boswell. I mean, what a career. He's going to retire. 52 years of covering sports, Zach. What was it like to read Boswell every day in the newspaper? Yeah, and that's kind of the what every little sports writer, every aspiring sports writer does growing up. They read the local paper, they read the columnists, they read the beat reporters. And I was very lucky that my parents were subscribers to the Washington Post, and I got that on my doorstep every morning growing up. Uh, even now to this day, he was someone I'd still turn to after – 
you know, with the Nats were making their run in 2019, I was obviously covering the team for a little bit. Um, but as, as the playoffs went on and, and I was sort of watching from home, I was, you know, getting the newspaper every morning. And I was reading his column from the game after, from the day after the game, from the game after this, the day after the NLCS, the World Series. And it's just, it's just incre- incredible writing. The way he's able to kind of take advantage of the English language and recall other anecdotes in his life and other anecdotes in literature that he's just able to kind of maneuver into his own writing seamlessly is something I've you know always respected. It's been one of my favorite you know, writers in the post. I mean, I've, I've read almost every writer at the post over the last 10, 15 years. Um, but, you know, he's obviously legend status and just being able to kind of sit next to him in the press box a few times was something I'm probably never going to forget. And you know, as I keep going to the industry, it's definitely going to be something I look back on and be like, wow, like I, I shared, I shared a seat. I shared a desk with Tom Boswell for a few months. That's very well said. And we all have those names that we have in our mind who inspired us and may you all inspire the young writers in the future. Maybe they uh, someday will be saying those words about you and looking up to you and all that you've done for them. Really appreciate what you've done for us here today with the St. Louis chapter of the Baseball Writers Association of America, Ball Talk. Russ Dorsey, have a great one in Chicago. Really appreciate your input. Thank you. Jeff Jones of the Belleville News Democrat. Zach Silver of MLB.com. <laughs>